everyone I'm back so I'm hoping that since uh, Gary announced it early this morning that we'll get more people joining I, I keep seeing people uh, posting after the fact after we've already done a live video uh, commenting that they had just seen it 15 hours later and it's it's aggravating it would be nice to to be able to reach everyone um, at the same time, but um, um, I'm grateful we have Facebook and a and such a great group of fans there to uh, to chat with. But sometimes it is aggravating when the posts get suppressed and and not all of the people who have chosen to follow us uh, get to see those posts. So, but we will post this if there's good information on here. We'll go ahead and post this on um, our YouTube channel so that uh, everybody can watch it later. So if you have any questions, this is kind of a, um, a casual kind of thing today. Um, I just wanted to um, chat a little bit about how I got started in digitizing and machine embroidery. Um, and if you have questions, just throw them out there and Gary will read them to me so that I can try to answer them. I don't have all the answers, but I can try to answer if there's anything I can answer. Um, I started, <clears throat> excuse me, um, machine embroidery about, oh, I don't know, 16 years ago. I learned to digitize, yes, Gary has a question already. Uh, Julie Pompa, Pompa, sorry, Julie, uh, wants to know, do you ever have sales? Uh, actually, I don't have sales because when I first got started 15 years ago, I, I, I really didn't have a philosophy then until I had more experience and I had a, a few sales at the time, but I have come to realize that, and the more fans uh, that we've gathered the more this became an issue that a lot of people felt like they they were slighted because they had bought when a when a design is first released and people buy it i i really cringe now knowing what i know that if i have a sale those people are going to feel slighted i mean why why buy something when uh, at regular price because they might go on sale next week so I have a shirt early on very very early on um, I realized that was not right um, there is no way I could be fair to everyone by when having sales because because the most loyal customers have already purchased at regular price I want to be fair to the most loyal customers and their and as a side effect to that I um, hope to be fair to everyone so when you purchase something from our website there is no no uh, kicking yourself later because you bought too soon or you should have waited or um, uh, you know whatever you just can be assured not that someone else is not going to get it for cheaper if, if they wait long enough and that's just my philosophy it may not be somebody else's philosophy that's just how I feel because I used to cringe when I participated in certain um, discounts a couple of times a year and I finally just I could not I just didn't feel good about it and I finally just said there's I, I just can't do this it's not it just didn't feel right and so I just keep my prices very reasonable I think and you can purchase without fear that uh, you're going to be kicking yourself next week or next month and you have a design to use right now as soon as you you buy it you have it you don't have to worry about sales or whatever you just you're getting a fair price you're getting a high quality design and um uh that's that is my deal to you is i am giving you or i'm exchanging a high high quality design um, for your loyalty 
Um, the other thing I have done to to help with that, to to show my customers that I appreciate them, is uh, to offer the free alphabets. Over the years, I've offered, I think, um, uh, actually I haven't counted them in a while, maybe 23 alphabets, and every one of those letters is an individualized, digitized design. There is no auto-digitizing going on here, and every stitch is paid close attention to. It's an honest to goodness, just as good as any other design on the website. Every one of those letters is is meticulously digitized. Yes. Oh, I thought you had another question. Um, one of the questions I get is what uh, software I work in. I, I use the Bernina software. I'm on version uh, 7 at the moment. I have not... Uh, I have always in the past hurried and upgraded whenever they have a new release out. And sometimes I I wish I hadn't because um, none, I don't think any of the uh, embroidery software is the perfect package out there. Um, I do love the Ver Bernina software, maybe, maybe because uh, it does a, a lot of things that I think some of the other software packages don't do. But also I've grown to love it because it's what I know. Um, uh, and so what you know is what you're comfortable with. And I happen to know though that uh, when I started in it, I knew it was very powerful digitizing software, so I felt like I was off to a good start. I didn't upgrade to version 8 because I'm not, I, I don't use the bells and whistles in the software. I do all basic fill stitches. Uh, I don't use fancy stitches. Um, I just don't use some of those uh, fancy things that are included in the software. I do everything manually, and if I want a certain effect, I just work it in manually uh, on my own. Um, because that way I know I have control over every stitch that goes into it, and I know what I'm trying to do, and I know what I need to do to achieve it. So, uh, I just don't really need the bells and whistles. There might be some things in it that that I might find useful, but I, as of yet, every time I've updated, uh, thinking, oh, no, there's some really cool new features, I don't ever use them. So, I've just decided this one final update that they had was version 8. Um, I just wasn't interested at the moment in in um, upgrading to that. Um, they do have a trial version, I think, um, and I meant to to download that and just take a look around, and I've just had so much on my plate, it's just not a priority right now. Uh, yes. Uh, I'll take this question. This is uh, Gary behind the camera. Uh, this is from Roslyn. Roslyn says she's having a trouble. It says flash unavailable. I just wanted to let her know, Roslyn, that's letting you know that the uh, media player that Facebook uses to play these videos is a flash player and you need to uh, update your flash player and you can just Google updating flash player and you should be able to do that so I just wanted you to know that's why you're not seeing anything right now so oh and Gary has some of that uh, information that he Googles and tries to find answers for you um, sometimes it, uh, Gary's our, our uh, uh, customer support slash tech support and I we're both some of this stuff is learn as you go and some of it has nothing to do with the designs or our website but Gary does try his very best to find answers for you and help you figure it out as he's able yes Rosie wants to know what thread brand do you use in your samples I use uh, Floriani polyester um, I used to use Madeira, so the older designs were stitched with ma uh, Madeira polyester, the polyneon. Uh, they call it Madeira polyneon, but it's the polyester version of the uh, 40 weight uh, embroidery thread. It's all 40 weight. Um, those polyester uh, threads are um, very durable. So I think across the different brands, they're all extremely durable. They stand up to hot water, bleaching. Uh, ironing they just they're really durable threads and um, but 
I think the selling point for me was the sheen on the, um, uh, first of all, the Madeira. And then when I saw the prettiness of the Floriani, I, I ended up switching to Floriani. I still have my Madeira stash, which I do um, use if I don't have a certain color in the Floriani, if there's a certain green I have my heart set on or uh, something to use in the design, I'll go ahead and, and use Madeira. So there's no problem mixing the two brands in one design. It's not an issue at all. Um, I do use my Madeira sometimes. The colors I probably won't use uh, much in the future because I already have the equivalent of it in Floriani. I'll use that to wind bobbins if I'm doing um, uh, a lace design that needs to have the bobbin color matching the top color. Uh, if I'm doing pastel colors, um, uh, if I'm using pastel colors for lace, I'll go ahead and use um, maybe regular white bobbin thread. But when I test my designs, I usually will fill a bobbin with matching color to make sure that if you decide to match the color, it will still work for you. So um, uh, I will do that with the angels in certain designs. Did you have another question? Yes, there's several. Oh, okay. um, we'll try and answer every question. And I don't have a time limit, but um, we'll try. I'll try and catch you all. Lori was asking about the tutorial for the napkin linen edge corner design is not on the website now. And she's wanting to know if you're going to do an updated tutorial for it. Oh, we have, um, we've had to do a little bit of switching around with our videos. And I apologize. We were going to post the link to the video, which is on YouTube, on our YouTube channel. So if you uh, Google, go to YouTube, doc, YouTube it's youtube.com and then in their search uh, bar put uh, Sonia Showalter and our channel the old channel comes up but also our new channel our new channel our active channel has my picture on it the other one is just a big red or pink dot with the letter S in it um, so go to our YouTube channel the napkin corner tutorial is in there that's a really old video I did when we used to do the flip videos and so it's not the perfect quality, but I think it's, it's still very useful. Uh, you yes. mentioned this before. Rosalind would like to know which digitizing program you use. I use the Bernina uh, uh, designer software, and I'm on version 7. And actually, I got sidetracked with thread. So, but this is casual, so hope you don't mind me going on tangents. Um, I started digitizing 15 years ago, well actually 16 years ago, uh, pretty much self-taught. Uh, I used to work at a local quilt store selling the machines and the software, it was a Bernina uh, store. And so my first machine was a Bernina 180. I eventually retired that one and got me a little Deco 650 uh, for testing embroidery and it is it was such an awesome little machine. Later, I bought uh, a couple of Brothers 750 for, so I had two machines going. Uh, those were all single needle machines. Um, if anybody's looking into a Brothers 750, 750's probably not even on the market anymore, but I've seen people talk about 770. It's probably the same ones. I mean, same, similar machines. They're awesome machines. Yes. Did you mention the software you use? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol would like to know, she thinks your designs are beautiful. Do you do any other type of artwork? I used to paint, uh, do oil paints and draw. I actually, when I was, I think it was 1990, I had a drawing of uh, one of my daughters that uh, the state of New Mexico bought from me and I was so thrilled that they had picked one of my pictures it, it was this big and they have it hanging in the uh, uh, motor vehicle offices in uh, Alamogordo New Mexico <laughs> and when I took my daughter in to get her driver's permit I, I had to tell the ladies that and they just they were 
they were so thrilled to have this because my daughter was eight at the time that I had taken that photo and then turned it into a, a hand drawing. And, um, and it was the funniest thing because they're looking for art and uh, looking to put art in public places, uh, art done by New Mexicans. And um, they wanted something that was, you know, that dealt with the culture. And it was funny because that portrait was actually a picture I took of her when we lived in Hawaii. She was eight years old. We were on the beach. She was all wet and her hair was all wet. And it's just up from here up. And um, they fell in love with it and had to have it. It had nothing to do with New Mexico other than I lived in New Mexico. So. Uh, Rosie would like to know, uh, could you consider stating the thread number used in your samples? I actually do that with all new designs. There was a short span of time when, um, this was several years ago actually, uh, when I started out I was writing every number down and uh, I just kept hearing people say, well, I don't use numbers. I, I pay, do my own thing or I have a different brand or I, and I just, uh, being the rebel that I am, I thought, well, phooey, that's a lot more work than I need to be doing then. So I stopped putting, I stopped, I took the easy way out and, uh, and I thought, well, good then. I'm glad they're not relying on numbers because that's a lot of work. So I just started writing like descriptions of the color and then sure enough, People started asking me why I didn't include numbers. So I think there was maybe a one year, maybe two year period in there. So those designs that fell in that time will have descriptions. And um, But I promise you, after I realized my mistake, I went back to writing numbers and um, uh, including the brand if it's Floriani or, Poly or uh, Madeira. Yes. Betsy says, could you talk about sewing the tiny earrings? How to make them? I'm scared to try. Uh, this Becky? Be Betsy. Oh, Betsy, Betsy. Betsy, if you go to our YouTube channel, there is a video called, and it's perfect for you, it's called uh, Overcoming Your Fears. Is that what it's called, babe? Um, <laughs> it's had something to do with... Success with freestanding lace. But I think it's called Overcoming Your Fears or something. Go to our YouTube channel. You go to YouTube.com uh, and in their very own YouTube search uh, uh, bar, put uh, Sonia Showalter. You'll go right to our channel and, uh, and just look for it. It's uh, Overcoming Your Fear of Freestanding Lace, something like that. And uh, uh, I think you will have all the answers in that video. I, I, it goes on for about 30, 35 minutes or so, but I just, I get meticulous about making sure I try to, to, to answer every possible question that might come after the video, so uh, I may give you more information than you want, but I promise you most of it will be totally necessary. I think you'll learn a lot just from watching that. Cindy would like to know, do you use the poly threads on the boutique? clothing line as well and how does that wash? Uh, the poly, yes, I use the polyester threads on the boutique clothing line. They wash wonderfully. Um, we've got several dresses that have been through the wash many, many times and um, uh, I still, when we visit our granddaughters, their little dresses are hanging in the closet that they have now outgrown, some of them, and um, uh, you can tell they've been washed and washed and they hold up very well. Any others? Okay. Um, so I'll go back to uh, my digitizing history. Um, I was pretty much self-taught. I, I, like I was mentioning, I worked at a local clothes store. I was selling uh, Bernina machines and the software. Um, I pretty much started... Uh, getting interested uh, because of that. And then I started wanting to know more about the software in particular. So I, um, I just started reading my manual. And at the time you would get a manual that was, I may have put it in a storage box somewhere, but the original manual was like war and peace. It, it was 
pretty big manual, pretty good sized book like this, and it was probably that thick. And so I would, I would sit in front of the computer and practice doing things that interested me, how to control the edges, how to add control points, how to reshape everything, and um, how to work with the lettering, um, uh, just to kind of unlock all these mysterious things that I was just totally mesmerized that there was such a thing as this kind of technology. And, uh, and the more I, I improved and learned, the more I would, if, if I couldn't be in front of my computer learning because I had a doctor's appointment or had to, you know, go somewhere and uh, anytime I had to go anywhere away from my computer, my manual came with me and I would just, uh, things that may have stumped me, uh, while I was sitting at the, uh, computer, then I had time to go back and just see, you know, what else I needed to do and, and, uh, but also in front of the computer, I also, I had my manual in my lap and I would just look up stuff, you know, if I wanted to, um, uh, uh, reshape something or, or copy and, and mirror it or uh, how to align so that they would all be on the same level or, or centered around a certain thing. Just little exercises like that. I would just, if I didn't know where the tools were or I didn't know which tool did what, I would just look it up in my manual and, and just follow through and take note, note of it and practice it, practice it. And then as you're practicing, you want to move on to the next step. Well, you don't know how to do the next step. So you have your manual right there. Look it up. And I went through that entire manual. At night, I'd go to bed, have my manual, and I would be reading my manual. Just reading it. Just to see what kind of things I hadn't noticed yet. And you always learn something when you do that. These days, that's the kind of thing I'm doing with photography. So I've kind of, even though I'm still digitizing, I still uh, can, I don't know every single thing about digitizing because I don't know what I don't know. I know what I know, and uh, I know when I try to do new things, it might present a challenge as to, okay, how am I gonna pull this off? Um, then I just figure that out because at some point, you already know what your tools can, you know, they're for, um, but you might, have a new edge on how to use the tool in a creative way or something. So I'm always, I try to keep pushing myself so I'm not just doing ho-hum stuff all the time. And, um, but these days my education has, um, uh, is in photography um, because I want to take my photography and my fine art photography to higher levels. And um, uh, so I've been, I've been, uh, investing a lot of uh, time and uh, my free moments in uh, photography lessons and techniques and um, just to see just so I can advance in that because where I was in digitizing maybe 10 years ago is where I'm at in photography right now so I've come a long way with photography but uh, photography has so many different aspects to it that it's it's just amazing Catherine wants to know how the fundraising is going for Adam's dog. The fundraising is kind of uh, slowed down a bit. We're, we're not sure how much more we need because we're not uh, keeping the funds ourselves. We're, we're, our, we have another person who's, who's dealing with that for us. Um, I think we might be, I'm guessing, maybe... Twenty-five hundred to three thousand dollars short, and um, so I think it's wonderful because we just started it in October, and um, uh, it, it's just to me it'll. Uh, I have faith, and we pray about it, and I know God will will help us get this done because. Um, um, we just have faith. There's no way we, we won't be able to do this. So, um, um, so the answer is it's going fantastic. It's um, like everything else. Everybody has different things that they need to pay attention to. And 
and we're not the only ones in need and, and all that. So um, uh, we'll do another uh, publicity thing here in a few weeks and, and um, uh, get gear, get people pointed back to the uh, GoFundMe page and all that. So I, I think we're doing good. We'll be, we'll be great. The dog is in training for a full year, so delivery is sometime in the fall. So we have a few months to um, gather up the rest of it. And um, so, and we really appreciate all of the generous donations that all of you who participated in um, for this uh, provided. There were so many wonderful, generous people and, and uh, we really appreciate every single one of you who were um, participating in that. So, um, but we'll let you know when we have another little push for it and, and hopefully we can get it all wrapped up and, uh, you know, in plenty of time, so. How many grandchildren do you have? Well, we have, uh, within the last month, we had 10 and then 11. <laughs> so, um, Gary has two grown daughters from a, we're, this is our second marriage. Uh, I have two grown daughters, he has two grown daughters. My younger daughter uh, had a baby in February and his younger daughter, had her second baby uh, yesterday. So uh, we are growing like, um, I don't know, herd of rabbits. <laughs> Actually, we may be nearing the end of our, our stint here with grandchildren, but they are so beautiful and they're just a blessing and everybody's healthy and doing great. Yes. Sue wants to know, what is the trick to be sure designs don't pucker? One of the things that I always, always do is starch my fabric thoroughly. So if you're um, stitching on um, a woven fabric, make sure you starch, iron and starch it until it's nice and stiff. That's your first line of defense against puckering. Um, you hoop your project, and the way that I teach how to hoop the um, water soluble in the freestanding lace video. That's exactly how I hoop my fabric. Um, you want it drum taut, uh, but you want to make sure you're not distorting the weave in that fabric. So you're just pulling gently around the edges and keep going until it's nice and taut, but everything's squared up inside the hoop. Um, and make sure that it's secured so it does not slip. And most of my directions will give you tips on, on that. Um, most every design, especially the alphabets, they'll, they'll tell you in there what's the best way to stabilize to make sure that you're stabilizing properly. Um, I usually use a tearaway stabilizer. I, so I put the fabric in the hoop, not stabilizer, just my fabric in the hoop. And once my everything's uh, locked in and ready for the machine, I put the hoop in the machine and then I slide a piece of medium weight um, tear away, which is, that's generally called floating. You just slide it under your hoop um, when the hoop is on the machine. And uh, that's really all I do. Um, if you can't hoop your project, I normally will hoop water soluble stabilizer, just one layer. Um, you still need to starch your fabric until it's crisp. Um, hoop the water soluble stabilizer until it is very taut and very secure in the hoop so it's not going to slip and get loose while the machine is, you know, moving, wiggling your hoop around. Um, when you put your fabric in, you need to baste the fabric to your stabilizer. So if you're using spray, uh, embroidery spray uh, that makes the stabilizer tacky, that could help, but it's not enough by itself because that fabric is not going to stay. You're you're battling the pull, the push and pull of those threads in that fabric, and there is no way that 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 uh, tacky stabilizer is going to hold that fabric in place for you. Um, that's just a tug of war. You're not going to win if you don't stay. You don't um, uh, um, baste your fabric down to the uh, stabilizer. Um, and then it's just a matter of just stitching it and then you remove the basic stitches, uh, trim away the water soluble. If you need to, you can rinse it off and, and then you do your pressing. Um, but those are the best ways to combat 
uh, puckering, assuming you have a good quality design. If the design is not good quality, it doesn't have good um, a good foundation of stitches underneath the uh, fill stitches, um, then it's it's pretty much um, gonna buckle under its own weight if um, um, if that's the case. So um, so just first of all, make sure you have a good good quality design. Make sure you starch and iron your fabric until it's crisp. And then you're off to a really good start. Um, let's see. So I was talking about um, uh, learning, learning anything. You need to, if you really are passionate enough about it and you really are serious about learning it, it should almost, uh, okay, this is my experience. It almost consumes me. I can't wait to have pre free time to see another photography lesson, to see how to do these uh, fine art photo, this technique, and oh, I just downloaded a lesson for this or that, and I just can't wait to see it so I can try it. You know, sometimes I wake up at night thinking, when is morning coming? Because I really needed to do this project. And you know, that's the kind of thing that keeps me going and, and um, uh, keeps me excited. And, um, and hopefully I'm passing on that excitement to to my friends who can think like me. Because even if you're not interested in the same exact things I'm interested in, um, you still know that creative feeling, that desire to wanna make something new and, and, and look at it and marvel at it. Like, that used to be a flat piece of fabric and look what it, I was able to turn it into. It's just, to me, that's just, that's the reward in itself is to, uh, when I stitch a design, when I'm testing a design, I still can't believe that needle, that machine, is doing exactly what I told it to do. It's like, and even when I catch a mistake on my screen and it's too late to fix it because I, uh, for that test, I, I just stand there thinking, no, don't stitch that, I didn't mean to put that there. And you know, the machine's gonna do exactly what I told it to do. So, but I, I just find it so amazing that the technology is right there for um, for me to use it and, and create it at will, you know, and, and uh, I really praise God for the whatever skills and talents he, he gave me and the desire to, to want to learn how to use those skills and, and um, provide me with people who, who want to, to, you know, uh, be fans of that work and to to get excited about it with me. I just uh, I'm blessed that I can do this for a living, and I'm blessed that I have people who are excited about it with me, and uh, and we're able to keep our business afloat because of all of our wonderful fans out there. So the internet, you're all over the world, but yet we're a, we're a small world. We had several people who are sharing that Overcoming Your Fears video, so thank you for that, for getting that out so people can watch that. Uh, also, Sue says uh, she's never had one of your designs pucker. Ever. Way to go, Sue. That's the best testimony. Because um, I can tell you my designs don't pucker, but I think you'll believe it more from somebody else. And I, I take real pictures of real stitch outs of, um, uh, babe, can you hand me that top letter there, please? The P or the O, it doesn't matter. Well, don't wrinkle the, the fabric, please. <laughs> I'm trying to show them how nice it looks. <laughs> Guys, what are we gonna do with them? Well, here's my O, and it really is a stitch out. It really is on fabric and uh, um, this is the one I took a picture of for you to, uh, to see what you're getting when you download. And, uh, when a test doesn't come out, oh, when a test doesn't come out, well, of course I have to go back, fix it, test it again. And, um, that's really the process. There is no shortcut other than doing this. It's stitched on real fabric. Here's the back, so you can see I have not trimmed a single thread on this. This is how it comes out of the machine all done. And even though my machine does have automatic 
uh, trimming, there are no jumps for it to trim. So um, this is an actual stitch out of the letter O. So um, I appreciate that, that um, um, you can testify that my designs don't pucker. Um, so just set yourself up for success by starching thoroughly and um, uh, you know getting a good foundation set up for your design. Um, in the future, I would like to do, uh, I'm hoping in the near week or so, to do a tutorial on the barefoot sandals. Many of you have been asking about that. It's really, it's not difficult. And, and I did write out pretty uh, detailed instructions, but I know sometimes it's just easier to see, to see it with your own eyes and, and then to try and visualize it from printed instructions. Yes. Arlene wants to know if that's linen fabric you do your samples on, and I'm sure several want to know where you get your linens. Um, this is uh, weaver's cloth. It's kind of a, it's not as light as a quilter's cotton. Um, it's, it's a little bit coarser weave. It's not a heavy fabric, but it's just, and I think this is like a cotton polyester blend. I just get this at Joann's. And I just, I like it because you can see the, um, the weave in it. It's not so smooth. And then that way you can see that it's fabric on, in the pictures. Um, it's just easily available and consistent. It's, it's always been the same for years and years and years. And it doesn't change in weight and whatever. It's just always been weaver's cloth. Um, but I do stitch on other things, obviously. I do have, um, oh, let me show you this. This is a shout out to Susan Mars. This is one of her, um, I've shown a picture of this online already too. This is one of her little uh, hand towels. This is kind of a cotton, um, it's kind of a linen. It, it looks like linen. I think it's 100% cotton. And uh, anyway, I love her, her towels and things. But this is just one that I did with the same uh, alphabet can they see it clearly? Okay. Um, but instead of the uh, linen insert, um, I just put a, a piece of white uh, cotton in the middle. And it's kind of a, I think it's a slightly sheer cotton, but it was just to show you how it looks if it's all white. And also you can stitch this without the fabric in the middle. So um, you can, there's several different ways of doing it. Yes. She wants to know, does the design still lay out nice after washing? Uh, yes, they do. And what you do is um, uh, you can, if you need to, you can go ahead and, and press it again the way that I show. Uh, when I press the lace in the uh, lace video, that's basically the same way I press um, uh, stitch designs. So um, you just lay this on a padded surface with two layers of wool, and I'm gonna do a video just on that. Um, two layers of wool felt, and then you put a piece of uh, light cotton over the top of that so that the wool doesn't stick to your threads. And uh, you, you wanna have this damp. You lay it face down, and then you let it rest, you kind of smooth it out with your fingers, let the fibers kind of rest. And then you start setting the edges with, your, with the tip of your iron. Because if you plop your iron right on top, whatever is out of whack is gonna stay like that. So this design does have a presence in the fabric. So you just wanna be uh, careful with the way you set it, go around the edges. And once those are set, then you can iron the whole design and no problem. So it shouldn't be a problem at all. She, yes. also, she also wants to know, how do you compensate for the shrinking? The, these towels, I haven't had any problem with them shrinking. So I don't usually, ha I, I guess I haven't really thought too much about it because I haven't had any issues like that. Um, I'll test that deliberately and let you know. If I know something's gonna shrink quite a bit, 
like my, uh, oh, going back to the linen, let's see. Actually, I'll show this one. Going back to where I get my linen, if you go to, um, fabric hyphen fabric I'm trying to think let me think about it i'll pull it up on the computer in a minute i know i've posted the link before but what i'll do is i'll post the link to the fabric uh place that i get my linen from in this thread so at the end of the video and everything i'll go ahead and post that link at the bottom and then you'll see in my response to your all your questions there i'll go ahead and and you'll find the link there but the linen is this is linen this is 100 percent linen i knew this was going to shrink quite a bit so this i pre-washed and um and then i uh then i stitched it so um that way it's going to get, you know, linen gets that natural kind of bumpy look, which I think is, is charming. Let me show you. I have these linens I was, I was working on. I left them in the dryer too long, and so they got some creases in the wrong places. But that bumpiness that, that's part of the charm of linen, I just think that's so pretty. And um, the company that I post the link for, they just have these wonderful linens that uh, are really excellent prices. The shipping gets a little pricey, but it's heavy. This linen is heavy. So I figured if I ordered, um, I think I ordered four or eight yards. It came out to almost a dollar a yard for shipping uh, because it gets so heavy, but they put it on sale all the time. They're always having sales. Um, so a lot of times it's between um, seven and eight dollars a yard. So even with shipping, it's still a great deal. It's 57 inches wide and it's really high quality linen. So I think it's still a great deal. Um, and this is what it looks like if you press it. If you really want it fancy, that's the way it looks. But um, um, my intention was to throw this in the dryer when I need to, to uh, wash it again and just shake it out and, and hang it up. You know, just kind of straighten it up a little bit, let it dry. And I think these are, I love it. So those are my linens. Uh, don't forget Susan Mars, All About Blanks these little towels um, and this I've been testing shrinkage so I've got it all pinned and labeled which direction was which which was the grain which was across the grain how much did it shrink and so I was gonna share that information with you when I'm ready when I have all my information together um, on how to uh, make these rustic uh, napkins out of this particular linen and which linen it is and all that um, different colors and which colors they are and what I like about them and all that. So I thought that would be fun when, when I'm finally ready to do those. I'll be happy to share that information with you. Uh, yes. Uh, some want to know if you ever do custom designs. I used to do custom work, but eventually it I realized I just didn't have any time to do them. I get several requests um, monthly, I think, um, but I just can't. Uh, I can't stop what I'm doing to do custom work, so I finally just had to realize I, I couldn't do it all. So that was one of the things I. If I you had ever to drop. write into the comments box with a suggestion, I do keep a running list for Sonia of everyone's suggestions. It's a huge list, but uh, whenever she needs other inspiration or anything, she checks over this list and has pulled things from it. So uh, keep the designs coming. So uh, we we're always inspired by different places. I do. I do. Um, 
take a look at that list and and as I told you in my one of my previous videos I keep a I keep a journal too of ideas and sometimes your ideas are my ideas and sometimes your ideas is is a twist on one of my ideas and I think wow that's a cool thought and um, uh, so you know if you think of something and if I haven't gotten to one of your suggestions please know that I Sometimes it can take me a couple of years to finally even get to one of my own suggestions to myself because I just have so much stuff in line already that um, uh, sometimes it takes me that long to finally get, get any, a particular thing done. Uh, Becky wants you to repeat again where you got the fabric that you showed. Uh, I'm going to post the link in the thread that you're commenting on. Uh, at the end of the video because I can't remember the exact website um, it's fabric hyphen something and I, I I can't remember if it's fabric hyphen I, I can't remember I'm sorry um, so I will post the link I promise at the end of this thread after the video is all finished uh, so just come back check back in this um, in the thread later on and, and you'll find the link Patty says, is the linen from fabrics-store.com? Uh, fabrics That's it. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you, Patty. And this is the uh, L019. This, this weight is kind of a, it's a 5.3 ounce weight. And I was going to look on see here because I labeled it. But I, I think I know it by heart. It's L019 is the uh, particular, um, uh, not model, but uh, fabric, um, uh, the version that I got of the linen. Because they have pretty heavy weight linens. And then they have like a gauze weight, handkerchief weight, um, and then they have the 5.3 ounce, which I really like. Yes. Sue wants to know, have you thought about having a how-to on the website? How-to like... Uh, like a webinar, maybe? Uh, can you be more specific? Uh, while she writes in... Uh, oh, tips. She's looking for... Oh, tips. Tips. Um... That might be a good idea. I, I probably should start compiling some tips and just adding them uh, at, a, at one location where you can just kind of glance over them and glean some good information from. That's a good idea. I think we may do that. Di says, I've asked for a wedding angel and maybe a baptism angel, please. And she also sent you two kisses. Please die. Don't give her a big head. <laughs> um, you know, I started a wedding angel. I don't even know when I started that wedding angel. And I work on it. I put it away and forget about it. So I'm going to put that down. Hold on. I am making myself a note right now. Oh, whoops, wedding. Okay, I'm putting it right here. Can't miss it. So, thank you for the reminder. And what was the other one? Um, baptism angel. A baptism angel. Okay, I'll add that. <laughs> That doesn't, I'm not promising next she's, week. <laughs> she's laughing. She says, my baby girl's getting married in October. So no pressure, but October. So. Oh, okay. No pressure, but it gives me an incentive. So I have, okay, I'm putting oct right there. All right. I will make a point of getting out my wedding angel and seeing how far I've gotten with it and get on with it. So, um. Uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? Um, uh, so I started in a quilt store and it, uh, when I realized I wanted to sell my own designs, I um, uh, decided to do that full time. So um, I, I quit my, it was a part time job. I quit my job and 
um, started to to really get serious about digitizing. I never I never did auto digitizing. If you think there's a program out there that you can buy that turns a picture into an embroidery design, don't believe it because uh, it can turn it into an embroidery design, but it's not the quality of design that you would probably want to stitch on anything. Um, uh, auto digitizing, you can usually tell auto digitizing. Sometimes the satin stitches look uh, kind of pinched in, in some of the details or, or some of the, uh, uh, what should be a satin stitching is really a fill stitch and it's got jagged edges or, um, uh, it's just, uh, it just looks not so good. So, um, don't rely on auto digitizing, learn, learn to digitize. If you really want to learn to digitize, uh, take the time. Now there's no shortcut. There's no shortcut for me to learn photography. There was no shortcut, uh, to get good pictures of my designs so that you would have a really good picture to look at to make a de decision on whether you like the design or not. Um, the, the, there is a shortcut actually, uh, which is a screenshot of the design on my software screen. Um, but that's not, there is no shortcut for a good way to present designs. Um, yes. Uh, Sue wants to know, would you ever do an online class for digitizing? I am definitely considering it. Um, I've been keeping it a secret, but we are looking into uh, what I need to do. It's a learning curve, but um, I've started to look into some ideas on how I want to do this. Um, and I would like to do some, some online courses that you might be able to purchase and just do them like mini classes maybe so it doesn't feel overwhelming and, and um, uh, kind of step-by-step -step type of things, lessons, um, uh, where you're actually looking at my screen and, and uh, it's just some exciting stuff that Gary and I are working on and, and um, I'm relying on him to figure out how to get me set up and um, so that we can actually do some of that. Did you have another? Okay. So um, when I started my photography, uh, my photos for um, online, when I first started uh, selling my designs, I was selling at one of the malls, and the malls have rules. Uh, when I started, I really didn't know. Um, I, I had no idea how to create a website, how to do uh, a cart, how to do PayPal. I mean, I was so green. I knew how to digitize, but uh, so I didn't know how to get my stuff onto an uh, online business. So um, I started out with one of the malls, and so I just kind of followed their directions and, and the rules on, on uh, how to package the designs and um, how to provide the images and all that. And at the time, the rule was the images couldn't be more than one inch by one inch. So I always had an issue with that, but I just, I thought that's just the way it is, you know? Um, I, I don't know any better, so I'm gonna do it I'm told. Um, and you know, every, every mall owner has their own thing and that's, you know, totally up to them, and they're right, of course, and everything. So I had, um, my images were all one inch by one inch, and I just, I couldn't see how that could possibly attract people, but thought, well, everybody else is doing it, so I guess it works. Well, it doesn't work that great. So eventually I moved to another mall, and by the way, I am so grateful for that one mall owner because she taught me a lot about what I needed to do and, and just exposed me to the world of embroidery. So um, uh, I am, and I, I told her I am just so grateful when I had to leave the mall. I just, I, I told her how much I appreciated her and everything. So, I mean, I understood her rules and everything, but for my business, that just wasn't working real well. 
So I moved on to another mall and uh, there I was able to upload um, bigger images, which to me, that was one of the crucial things for me, bigger images. But bigger images meant better quality images. So I had to figure out a way to take better pictures. Um, and if you've ever tried to take good, good pictures, uh, you know the challenges. It does. It's not as easy as it might seem. And maybe now these days it's a little easier. The phone, the phone cameras are awesome because even in low light and and certain circumstances, they take pretty good pictures. Yes. Uh, Maria likes your designs, uh, and she is starting to learn how to digitize. Uh, she uses Imbird, and she wants to know if you do do classes. Would they work for those of us who have different software? I think if I uh, do classes, I, I know the Bernina software and I have one other software I want to teach in, but at first I have to get familiar with it. And, well, okay, I'll tell you the, the secret. A while back, Wilcom had approached me to partner with them. And, um, and so there was a lot of um, negotiating went, that went on, and, and this was a couple of years ago. And so, like with all things, big companies, it takes a while to, to iron things out and, and get things set up just right. So, um, but now I think we finally got it down. Um, I'm working with them in Hatch, and Hatch is really, really, really similar to the Bernina software. And you may know, Wellcom developed the Bernina software, or at least they were contracted, I think, by Bernina to create the Bernina software. So that may be why they're so similar. So um, I still need to fit, find my way around Hatch, you know, trying to find the tools and everything. Um, but if you don't have software, I, I suggest you try Hatch. They have a 30-day uh, free trial uh, download. It's awesome software from what I've looked or uh, from what I've seen and investigated in it and stuff. I need to actually sit down and, and create some things with it. But to answer the question, um, I would like to do some videos in uh, obviously Bernina but also in Hatch. But uh, what I intend to do is explain because I don't know the other software packages. Um, uh, I intend to explain what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and try to use enough language that you can translate that to your software. So if I say I want to do uh, a fill stitch that's such and such you know, millimeters long and such and such uh, 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 amount of space between the stitches, you know, then I could remind you that your software should be able to do that. It's, you're going to have to know where your tools are, but I think once you look at, it's kind of like um, teaching you how to paint. I can teach you I can teach you um, how to mix colors or how to uh, prepare your canvas or something, but you're going to have to go find the, your own brushes and know where your brushes are. You know, I can't tell you where to go find your one inch brush in your drawer in your kitchen or, you know, so it's just a matter of finding where your tools are and um, uh, how to read the numbers in your software and how to uh, determine the size of your design or, you know, it, there should be enough generalities in there that you should be able to use those same, uh, use the lesson to translate it into your own software. Yes. Sue says she thinks pathing is one of the hardest things to learn. I think pathing can be one of the easiest, um, uh, and I would teach a lesson on how to do that. Uh, and I would explain to you entry and exit points. So whatever software you have, you should have the ability to change entry and exit points. Um, I can tell you um, some software have entry and exit points settings where you can have it do 
uh, closest join or something similar to that. That's what my software says, but yours might say something similar that will mean the same thing. I can explain to you what that means and I can tell you to turn that off. Um, uh, control points should be about the same. Uh, the round, the ones that make round uh, uh, curves and the ones that make squares. Um, so basically, I mean, you should be able to translate that into your own software. So I would say if you think you would like to learn to digitize, learn where your tools are, learn what they're for, at least read your manual on that. And that doesn't mean you have to know how to create a design. You just need to know where, you know, your uh, copy and paste tool is or where your, how to open up your control points, how to select a, a how to make selections, you know, to hide, to click on an item to move it. Uh, just simple things like that would be really helpful for you to at least get started because you can't start until you know that. Um, no matter what software you're going to use, you have to know where your tools are and what they're for. Uh, some of the extra special fills and fancy uh, uh, stitches and all that stuff uh, can wait. But your tools, your selection tools, your aligning tools, your um, uh, control points tools, or how to open your control points, those tools just go through your manual. There should be a place in there that tells you exactly what those tools are. And if you can't understand what it's trying to tell you that tool's for, sit in front of your computer, turn on that tool, and practice with a with some design or something and, and just practice on group and ungroup and, and um, um, delete or copy and paste, mirror, just do those simple exercises and get familiar with, with that room because that design space, that's a room you're in. You want to get familiar with your surroundings so you'll know where to go to, you know, get the scissors out because you want to cut something, you know. Um, it's all a matter of knowing where you are and where things are and, and what your tools are and what they're for. So that's a good place to start uh, from the very beginning. Yes. Oh. Um, but yes, you should be able to translate it. Uh, the only thing you might not be able to do is some, de some software may not have certain things um, uh, that... Bernina or Hatch have that I noted. I, I, I've, I've watched uh, YouTube videos on some of the other, other software just because I'm curious. Um, and I noticed that some of them don't have some of the capabilities uh, that Bernina has. But there's workarounds. You know, if it doesn't have that, it's not the end of the world and you can just, uh, you know, work around it. Um, and I can give you a suggestion on that as I go. But uh, I, I would like to do some basic digitizing classes and maybe some basics on making lace, um, what to look for when you're digitizing lace and uh, that sort of thing. So I'm excited about it and I'm hoping to do something uh, in the very near future. But um, I think, let's see, what else could I have told you? I don't want to go too long because uh, we could have another chat another time. Um, Bernita Software, uh, Selling Designs, uh, yes, I went from, from taking pictures that were one inch to larger pictures, which I had to, all I had was a little point and shoot camera, oh, I also had a scanner, for a while there I was scanning my stitch outs, and, uh, and then I had to remove the fabric from around the design, because that was part of the rules, and I think I spent more time doing that than actually digitizing. Um, uh, but as, as my designs, uh, became more numerous and I just, I just felt, felt the absolute need to take better pictures. So I had this parallel career in photography that I don't photograph for other people. So in that sense, I'm not a professional, um, but I do use it in my business in a professional way. I try to. And so I've kind of developed this parallel, um, it's been a parallel learning curve, um, but much steeper than learning to digitize. Um, 
because you, it seems you can't really know all you can know about photography. It, it, things are always changing and, and equipment changes. And, and the basics, yes, they stay the same. But uh, uh, just getting a new camera is like, how do I take a picture with this thing? Because um, the buttons are different. So there you go. But everything's a learning curve. But if you have the desire, you just learn to do it and feel like you've conquered the world when you get a pretty picture and, and you've moved forward a step. And so then you want to add to that. And um, it compounds after 15 years. Uh, I finally feel like I'm getting somewhere and, and um, uh, so I'm really excited about uh, my photography, so, um, the photography aspect because now I'm taking that off in another direction and I, I can't wait to show you some of the stuff I'm working on. So I think we're good and thank you so much for, for participating. I think there's enough here that we can post this to YouTube as, as a fun get to know us a little more video um, if uh, I will still post a link for the fabric store in this thread and don't forget to come to YouTube find us there and subscribe to our channel so that whenever we upload a new video you will be notified thanks everyone we love you bye bye